It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Monday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a part of your workday. And of course, big shout out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. You know what I love about this time of the year? Is that uh, for a lot of you listening, you're, you're not uh, <laughs> you're not trapped in your shop or your office, and you're trying to slug through the winter time. You know, right now the bulk of the audience is out and about. They're outside. They're in the tractor. They're in the you in the field, and uh, so we're we're talking about the things that you're dealing with right now. So I, I really love when we're broadcasting here in the middle of the growing season, and today especially because it's Agronomic Monday. Uh, on Mondays on Real Ag Radio, we always focus on agronomics, and today will be uh, exactly that. We joined by Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. He'll be here to talk about all things uh, agronomy. Got a bunch of questions for Pete that we're going to cover. We've got uh, fungicide application in a dry year. Uh, that's mainly when we're thinking about maybe the the, the corn market in, in eastern Canada as there has been a real, real dry bias. And uh, we're also going to cover some of the, the weather conditions out here in the west and uh, a whole lot more for sure. We're also going to hear a conversation in a recent Canola School episode with Sean Sanko of the Canola Council of Canada. He talked to Real Agriculture's Kara Oosterhaus. They talk about the early detection of black leg in your scouting when you're out in your canola fields. So uh, something that's really, really critical and important for you to uh, be taking into consideration. And uh, we'll also have time today for the top ag news stories of the day uh, as well. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or you can uh, call us on the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. And of course, you can always find us across all the different social media platforms as Real Agriculture as, as well. Hope you had yourself a great weekend. I, I did. We caught up with some uh, some old friends we haven't seen for a long time, which was a, a lot of fun on, on Saturday. That was great. Yesterday, spent the whole day in Great Falls, Montana, watching a American Legion baseball doubleheader. Beautiful weather. Beautiful weather. And uh, so that was good, too. Yeah, nice day for a drive. Uh, absolutely. So hopefully, whatever you did... You, uh, you enjoyed yourself, and uh, you recharged a little bit. And uh, probably a lot of you were out <laughs> scouting fields and doing stuff like that. So uh, it, is that, it is go time. It is that time of the year where you know, you're, uh, you're not afforded the ability to uh, take a whole bunch of time off. I, I fully realize that and totally respect it. Okay. Um, oh, we got some feedback here. Speaking of feedback, we should hit on it. Uh, Dawn, now, on Friday's show, we were talking about the viterra Bungie merger or, or potential thereof. Now... This was all triggered by Glencore trying to acquire tech resources, okay? Now, it seems like it's gone kind of cold, though, on that front, and when it comes to rumors around Bungie and Viterra potentially becoming new mates. Now, we were talking about the benefits of mergers, uh, or potential benefits, you know, the reason why you pursue them. Now, Don sent us an email, and he said... Uh, Well-executed mergers should result in cost savings for participants, definitely. Beyond that, there are advantages in market power that are less transparent. If you are the boards and executives of these companies, you will clearly want both for the benefit of your bottom line. Appreciate that email and piece of feedback, Don. I, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're talking about there. Got another email here from Dave. He says, U.S. listener here. He's a dairy producer in the mid-Atlantic states. He says, enjoy your show and listening to, and gives me a different perspective on all things agriculture from north of the border. I think there's probably just as much, just about as many Canadians listeners as there are U.S. listeners, I'd bet. I've learned a few things or two from listening. Enjoy the commentary in the U.S. Always good to hear what those outside the U.S. think of our quirks, but a question for you to ponder. And this is where, so Dave, first of all, thank you for listening. And yes, our American audience has really significantly grown and we really, really appreciate everybody having an interest 
in a Canadian ag. But let's be honest, a lot of stuff we're talking about applies south of the border as well, because the two industries are are so they're so integrated. They're aligned. They face some of the same challenges. We do have our skirmishes, especially on the trade front. You think about dairy, things like that. But uh, it, it's uh, a lot of commonalities, I think. So Dave asked, and I'm going to put this back to the audience. I'm this week going to try to come up with my own list. Okay. But you, I want you to chime in too. Can you name three Canadian egg strengths, three U.S. egg strengths, and then three weaknesses for each? So what are the three strengths of Canadian egg, three strengths of U.S. egg, and then the three weaknesses for each of those countries as well? I'm going to come up with the list. Boy, that's a good one. Now, now Dave has part two of this. After listing the three strengths and three weaknesses, do you think U.S. and Canadian egg complement each other? Or do we mostly just butt heads because we share several of the same strengths in common? Then add in, where does U.S. and Canadian legislation put us in the complementary versus adversary relationship? He says, for me, on the dairy side, I'd say it's complementary, but we're, we're like siblings. We have a spat now and then, but we get over it and make up. So Dave, I really appreciate this. Uh, this is a this is a really good exercise. So I am going to work this week on my own list of this. And I, I, if you have, you know, start with the three strengths and three weaknesses. If you were to name three strengths and three weaknesses for Canadian egg and U.S. egg, what would the what would that list look like? Give me three. Three of each, okay? So if you want to send those to shaney at realagriculture.com, I'll compare it to what I think it is, and then we can discuss it uh, as the week progresses here on the show. So uh, please take part in that. It'd be a lot of fun, and I uh, would love your input. Make sure where you're from, too, because I want to know if you're putting those three Canadian, or those, so let's say those three U.S. ag strengths, I know you're from Canada versus the U.S., because that's an interesting sort of uh, comparison as well. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to get to Peter Wee Pete Johnson here on Agronomic Monday right after this. have the financial tool you're looking for. An advanced payments program, Cash Advance from CCGA, is a low-cost farm financial tool that can help cover your spring working capital needs. Borrow your first $350,000 interest-free with the rest at prime less 0.75%. Apply on over 50 commodities. Call our experienced team or visit ccga.ca. Cash advances are made under the Government of Canada's Advanced Payments Program. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at pulseschool.com, realagriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587-787-1795 to book your on-location with Real Ag Radio today. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Agronomic Monday. This segment's brought to you by Granny Boar from U.S. Borax. Ask for it by name. Make sure you go to borax.com. Let's get rocking here with the agronomic topics here today. We're joined by Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. Pete, how was your weekend? The weekend was awesome, Sean. A lot of scouting on Saturday, uh, lots of work around home on Sunday. Really was was hopeful for a rain. A Friday night, it, you know, there was 30% chance of showers. And there was a couple of pop-up showers where growers caught maybe a quarter of an inch or something like that and you're going like please and, and a little bit of a mist coming on the windshield and you say yeah baby bring it on uh, didn't, didn't materialize so from a moisture standpoint a little bit uh, disappointing but from a from a work standpoint got lots done still still pretty dry 
in in the southwest uh, side of Ontario? Uh, driest May since uh, in at least forty two years, and no rain in sight. Mm. So we are incredibly dry, uh, and it's astounding. I mean, you'd know that the wheat crop and the hay crop that that would make a difference, but boy, it, it's uh, it just really is astounding to me how many growers when they plant a crop end up in a position where they need that one inch rain to save them it just hasn't happened so there are lots of of, uh, what's the right word constern like lots of consternation about soybean stands and corn stands and what to do with edible beans and she's 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 a hotbed of uh of discussion out in farmers fields these days yeah, and 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 with some of that dry weather, though, you you would think that this corn would really be rooting. But you've been getting some calls from some members of the audience having to potentially deal with rootless corn. Why would that be? So, uh, Sean, the corn crop, like where where it got into good moisture and where it got off to a good start, it, it's it's jumping. We had heat. Corn loves heat. We're not so hot this week, thankfully for the week winter wheat crop because it doesn't want the heat. But last week, the good corn was just going gangbusters. But there's too much where growers, either we got an air pocket around the seed or we smeared the sidewall or we didn't get it deep enough, we didn't till it deep enough or the residue got in the way. Man, the, like disc rippers this year, they are the bane of corn production's existence. It's not that way every year. But the majority of my calls have been problems from a disc ripper and strip till on the other side of the coin, where oftentimes, you know, with strip till, we, it, there's some challenges this year. It, it is strip till has worked very, very well from that standpoint. And I know on Twitter, not everybody agrees with that, but that's certainly my world. And I'm really worried about rootless corn because when we get into these situations where that corn seed, you know, they were barely on top of moisture. The the radical went down. We got those, the yeah, the radical root system is into moisture, but it it's flattened. It's like that ground is just hard and there is moisture, but there's nowhere for those roots to grow. And so they're struggling like crazy. And, and Sean, I have, I have fields that I've walked where these seedlings are two leaf. And you'd swear that they were the most drought-stressed crop you ever saw. Their leaf was rolled up. They were that gray color. And, and the question is, will they even survive? And then when you look where the, where the nodal roots, because rootless corn is the nodal roots that generally form at the three, four, five leaf stage. You look where those nodal roots are trying to come out on those seedlings that, that have three leaves. And they're just little nubbins. They're only, I don't know, a millimeter long. But they're coming out and they're hitting a lump. Uh, it's dry. It's hard. Man, if we don't get some moisture, those roots will burn off. Like they can't grow into those hard, dry lumps. And then you end up with rootless corn syndrome. And, and boy, that is never good. Yeah. And like uh, you could see how that would be. Uh, the way you described it is exactly how you would envision. Like it, they're having a hard time going down, so they kind of go out, and then you kind of get that just not less than ideal. And from a from a nutrient standpoint, th- there becomes a real concern if we're not getting those roots in into the depths that we thought we were going to. Well, absolutely. From, from a water standpoint, from a nutrient standpoint, in many cases, because it's been so dry. We are seeing all sorts of, of different symptomology that we almost never see. But growers that normally would spread some dry fertilizer on the, on the surface, work it in, and perhaps some nitrogen as well, work it in. Well, most of that, that fertilizer now is sitting in the top inch and a half because they work the field maybe three inches deep. If Not always, but, but they tried at least to work it three inches deep. Well, now where those corn seeds aren't deep enough and they're not getting good root growth, the salt concentration, because we've had no rain to dilute that fertilizer, the salt impact, those roots when they're coming out are, are sometimes 
coming into a high salt zone, sometimes the seed, if it's only at an inch and a quarter, you can tell that it's been in a, in a zone where the, it's just been more salt than you would like. Some of the, the adventitious roots come out and they just look like they're burning off or they're not making many laterals. That It's borderline. And, and that means that from a nutrient standpoint, if all of that nutrient stays in that top inch and a half and we don't get rainfall, man, I'm, I'm really worried about positional nitrogen shortages because the nitrogen didn't get moved down and the plant's going to be growing roots down in the, you know, six inch, eight inch, 12 inch zone. Uh, gosh, in the wheat fields, they're already, the, the plant's probably at two feet. And if the nutrients aren't where the water is, that doesn't work so well. Meanwhile, on the prairies, we've got, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely warmer conditions. And, and what we're seeing this week, you know, if you kind of look across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, there, there's multiple days of 30 Celsius or 85 Fahrenheit for all of uh, you followers of Fahrenheit out there. Um, you know, we, we've really warmed up. Um, now, some of these areas that are getting this heat, too, ha- have pretty decent moisture conditions. We are going to see this crop really launch higher with that kind of heat. Yeah, absolutely. The problem is that Western Canada is primarily canola and wheat, and neither of those crops like temperatures when they go over 30 Celsius. In fact, over 25 Celsius, wheat's not happy. Uh, You start going up into the mid-30s, and wheat actually is going negative. It can't grow as fast as the temperature is trying to drive it. It can't suck enough water, even when it's got good moisture. And I mean, it's definitely way better with moisture than the double whammy of no moisture and high temperatures, but it, it'll jump. But the, the high temperatures, if you're a corn grower, you're a soybean grower, yep, that's, they, they can tolerate those high temperatures. Mm. But boy, for the wheat crop in Western Canada, uh, it likes it cooler, so... I okay, but if just... we're okay, but hold on, if we're like I'm looking at what am I looking at here? Saskatoon, I think. Yes, I'm looking at Saskatoon. It is anywhere from 24 to 31. That's that sounds good. So with wheat, and here in Ontario, man, last week we were up to 33 a couple of days, 34 in some areas, and high humidity. Man, that. Uh, no, actually, really low humidity is what is the going most on weird here? thing. <laughs> exactly. It's like we we had lots of days at, at 20, 25% relative humidity, sometimes 15%, no dew in the morning. It's like, where do I live, man? Like, am I living in Lethbridge? Am I Sean Haney in yeah. Lethbridge? <laughs> oh, gosh, you're just totally different. Now, not every day like that, but, but a, a real string of them. And so I'm much happier this week because we have one day forecast at about 26 as a high. The rest is all below 25 as a high. And our nighttime temperatures are getting down into the, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 degrees Celsius range. It's critical true mm. grain fill in the wheat crop to lengthen that grain fill period that we don't have high temperatures. And with wheat, Sean, as soon as you go over 25, that's a, that 25 degrees Celsius is sort of a, a threshold where wheat's not happy anymore. So when you say you're 26 to 31, uh, 25 is the first threshold, 30 is the next threshold. You go over 30, wheat's really unhappy. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, we're not in a critical phase in Western Canada, so I don't mean to overflow it. Uh, but, you get to within three weeks and, and you're soon going to be there. Like the wheat crop needs to be happy from three weeks before heading, uh, you know, right through grain fill. If you're going to have big crops, it needs to be going gangbusters, maximum speed from 21 days before it heads out. And I expect you're probably with those temperatures going to start heading out somewhere around July 1st. Yeah, we're you know June the fifth today. Those it'd be nice to have cooler temperatures by by the middle of June for sure to get, keep that crop at its maximum yield yeah. potential. How critical is the low? Like you know, when I look at I'm looking at the Calgary forecast right now, and we're we're like twenty six to twenty seven all week. Okay, 
but the yeah. lows are anywhere from nine to fifteen. Uh, how 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 much should we pay attention to the lows at this time? I, I think from a herbicide standpoint, but that's not getting too low. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, so low temperatures make a big difference because. It's all about growing degree day accumulations. And the way we calculate that is high temperature plus low temperature divided by two. And wheat is a base zero crop. So the low temperature being low means we get less growing degree day accumulation every day. And we're going to get 600 growing degree days for grain fill on a spring wheat, give or take. So that means if we get less per day, we get more days of grain fill. And in 2022, why did Ontario have a record winter wheat crop? Because nighttime temperatures all through June were really, really cool. So we got a 35 degree, or pardon me, 35 day grain fill period. And, and that's long for us. So we had big wheat yields because we got more days of grain fill, four bushels of added yield for every day of grain fill in Ontario. And that's the number we use. It's not always exactly that, but it puts it in perspective. So those low temperatures, it's really beneficial if you can get them down into those single digits. We don't want them down at four, three, two, because that's too cold. But uh, keep them under 18 for sure. Here in Ontario, sometimes we'll have a 22-degree night. That's all bad. The wheat crop is just respiring away all the photosynthate it made the day before. Uh, but realistically, if you can get nighttime temperatures around 10 Celsius, the wheat crop is a very happy crop. Okay, well, that's good. It, you know what? And boy, this wheat crop seems very sensitive. All the things you say about corn all the time, I don't know. Wheat wheat has some its own sort of princess issues. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, Pete. <laughs> Yeah, so, so fair enough. But so does soybeans, and so does corn, and so does canola. Like it's just it's it's what they like. Yeah. Right? In in farming, all we try to do is manage the impact of the things that can go wrong. <laughs> right. It's like there, exactly. There's, right. Yep. There's like you know when you're like well right right like a pro and con right of a decision when you when you're thinking about all the things that can go right. It's a, like sort of a on the left hand column. It's a little bit of like a yeah. There's a few, there's some lines there, but on the what could go wrong side of the ledger, ay ay ay. It's it's a. You're going to need a couple of sheets of paper. Okay, let's take a break. We'll be back with more here on Real Ag Radio right after this. Did you know that Pioneer now has a full lineup of Enlist E3 soybeans? Take a look at Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans for the highest yield potential and for the best agronomic package and herbicide trade options. From the lab to the field, Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans are the best in beans, period. Ask your local Pioneer representative about Enlist E3 beans. As you head out into the field this season, the corn schools got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. Pete, do you remember celebrating your 50th birthday? Uh, yeah, I vaguely, kind of, sort of, <laughs> yes. <Why>? <laughs> vaguely <laughs> because it was a while ago or vaguely because you had too many pops? Uh, vaguely because those types of things are just like, it's not where my memory makes solid links. 
because it's it's not crop related and it's not a yield. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, Pete, uh, I, I I'll let you know here that uh, Alpine brand liquid fertilizers are turning fifty this year. So they're having a fiftieth birthday. They're going to remember it for sure. From the beginning, they have always applied the four R principles to their approach to the fertilizer industry with the right source, right rate, right place, and right time. They're committed to Canadian farmers, always delivering the highest quality liquid products, including their patented award-winning BioK line of nutrients. To find out more, visit them at alpinepfl.com or call 1-800-265-2268. Fun stuff. Okay, we're talking to Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson here on Agronomic Monday. Now, Pete, we posted a video in uh, on realagriculture.com. I believe it was a wheat school video. And uh, we were talking about T3 fungicides in a dry year. Now, before we get into it, because it it created a lot of conversation o- over the weekend, uh, on, comments on the video, comments in, on Twitter, social media. Um, what? Let, let's define T3. What stage are we at for those of us that don't follow from that standpoint? So any real wheat grower, any good agronomist, Sean, knows what a T3 fungicide application is. So, you know, here you are this, this budding agronomist and, and you're going like, what does that mean? Come on. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking the questions because I know that myself and a number of people in the audience are like T3. Can we talk less scientific? What, what am I looking at? What leaf? Yeah. So actually it's the, it's the head spray. So the fusarium spray, uh, basically the wheat heads out and two days after the wheat heads out, it starts to pollinate. And so it's the, that timing where we're trying to target the head with a fusarium spray and, uh, you know, the, the whole focus is on reducing the, the level of, of dawn in the crop and also still protecting the leaves from yield. But this is when we start getting into the specialty nozzles and making sure that we target that vertical head instead of the, the horizontal leaf. So it's, it's the last spray, the head spray, the scab spray, the fusarium timing, but the head is out and it's only been out for, you know, three, four, five days, something like that. Okay. Now the video talking about T3 fungi application, T3 fungicide application in a dry year. And it, so talk, talk about what the video discussed and what got people stirred up on both sides of the discussion. So, it's dry in Ontario. By the way, Sean, it's not just dry in Ontario. I've had the exact same question from growers in Michigan and even some growers in, in Wisconsin that have reached out saying, boy, it's dry here. What are we, you know, where are we at about that? So I, I talked a little bit about it on the word on Wednesday and Vern called me up. Vern Tobin from Real Ag called me up and said, Pete, that'd make a great, great wheat school video. So what we were trying to do Because on average, if you have good moisture and fusarium risk in Ontario, you just spray a T3 fungicide. You, you, the risk of dawn in your grain and making it unmarketable, we, it's always, it's ever present, present. That's the right term. It's ever present. So it's just an automatic thing. Plus the data supports that on average, it's basically a nine bushel yield gain and better quality straw, and there's so many wins out of doing that. But that's when you have moisture. And so fast forward to 2023, and we got one third or less of average moisture in May. And then we had this heat wave hit last week. And so the the numbers all change. The fusarium risk has dropped to as close to zero as possible. Never say never, but boy, the, pr- the probability of having a problem with fusarium or, or dawn in the grain is just incredibly low. And so that means that, well, we don't have the quality factor, plus it's super dry. And whenever it's dry, you get less disease potential. And when you have less disease potential, then probably you're going to get less yield benefit. And so when we look at the data, and, and this is exactly what we were trying to do, was help growers make the decision 
do we spray a tea tree fungicide or not, given the odd situation we're in in 2023? Super dry, no fusarium risk. The, the whole perception about, you know, using a fungicide for plant health, because we do get better plant health, we do get cleaner straw, but what is the economics of that? And so on a dry year, instead of a nine bushel yield, we're, we're probably looking at about a six bushel average yield gain, assuming that things don't go totally droughted and the crop dies from, from lack of moisture. And then you back up and say, well, do we have tramp lines in the crop? Because if, if we have only put on a single application of nitrogen early in the going and there's no track lines through that wheat field, well, now we have tramp damage as well. And that's about a percent and a half, give or take. So, you know, a percent and a half off of 100 bushel wheat, that's getting pushing close to two bushels. My six bushel gain becomes four bushel gain on average. And the economics really start to get tight from that standpoint. If you have the track lines and the wheat is coming back in those track lines, it's the exact opposite. Because now if I track them again, I don't get those green delayed maturity heads that I fight with messing up my sample in the crop. So there's all these different parameters. And, and yeah, uh, it, it's just been a really interesting discussion around whether you spray that T3 fungicide or not. And if you're on a sand soil and the crop has already gone blue from drought, it's in the leaf roll, or actually my great friend, friend Nature Nut Nick from Strass Roy, he's on heavy clay. The majority of his field is just going limp or rolling up from drought stress because those are the two soil types where you get drought stress first. Yeah. The, the blow sands because they don't hold it. The clays because they don't give it up. If you're in that situation, well, then I think spraying a tea tree fungicide becomes not economic. But on the other hand, <laughs> uh, Evan Arts, a great director with Middlesex Soil and Crop, tweets out a picture of his wheat crop, and he's on nice clay loam soil. And you just look at that and say, wow, the yield potential there is incredible. And the benefit there from that T3 fungicide, totally the opposite of what Nick is looking at. And you need to know what the, what the parameters are to make the best decision that you can. Yeah, you know, this is something that a lot of prairie growers have gone through recently through this whole period of real dry bias. And, you know, some growers, there's, there's a point where the answer is clearly no, but I have heard from members of the audience who are like, you know, even in those drier years, we did see uh, a difference. The easy decision though, is when, you know, like we heard last week from Jake Legui, who's in Fillmore on the Eastern side of Saskatchewan. And, you know, they've, they've got ample moisture, right? And so he's like, yeah, we pretty much have to do it. It's penciled in. We, we know, right? So there's, when it comes to something like fungicide, the easiest decisions are on the fringe, like so dry that the crop's turning blue versus like, yeah, we've got ample moisture, tons of moisture in the canopy. We know disease is a, is a huge risk. We got to protect the yield. It's this, and I don't know how big the swath is in the middle of those two fringes. Maybe it's just the standard bell curve look, but it, it becomes a lot more difficult, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what's really bizarre is that even though it's been so dry, like a lot of May, Ontario is more like Western Canada, as we said in the, in the first segment that, we, that I was on, right? That our relative humidity in Ontario is like 25% sometimes. And so you'd say, how can you have disease? And yet in some of the good crops, particularly further north where it stays a little bit cooler, we're still finding powdery mildew and a bit of septoria coming. And so you say, well, if the disease is there, that's going to have an impact on how much, how much yield benefit you get. And you're right. If you're in eastern Saskatchewan, you're getting lots of rainfall then I will guarantee you're probably got, you know, a tan spot in there and septoria in there and mildew and those diseases are going to beat you hard. So you better get out there and spray a fungicide. And it's probably not a T3 fungicide. It's probably a, you know, a T1 or a T2 kind of that earlier fungicide that more targets the leaf diseases. But uh, 
And there you get the big yield increase, which makes the economics go much easier. <laughs> but when you get kind of on the edge, uh, that, that makes it, you need a lot of information and every situation is different, right, Sean? Yes. And that's the one thing that, that really came out in in the discussion in the Twitter feed because we had we had growers uh, very very strongly minded one way or the other <laughs> and it's kind of like well wait a minute your your situations are probably different and that's why you have a different answer <laughs> but uh, yeah there was there was some good fun discussion yeah and, and a good reminder too do do some check strips right and and. Next year's conditions will not be exactly the same. There's no way they will be. They're, they never are for the most part. But do that check strip so that you can evaluate, right? Uh, otherwise, if you don't do it or you do it on 100% of the acres, like any product, you, you really just don't know. So do, do that check strip. Yeah, look at you go, Mr. I know. Agronomous Teeny. Well, like, you, oh, you were wow, slagging you are- me earlier, so I had to recover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Absolutely. Do the check strips. And, and then that you put that into your data bank for the next time these situations come along to help make you uh, give you information to make better decision next time. I don't like how I'm treated on this show. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's your show, Sean. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm being thin skinned just like wheat when it's so sensitive to some of this higher heat. I'm, I'm like the wheat crop. <laughs> Pete, what, what do you got planned this week? So uh, just a whole bunch of stuff going on this week, Sean. Wheat Pete's word is always on Wednesday. Uh, lots of scouting to, to do. Lots of discussions around soybean replants. Do we plant edible beans because we've got no moisture? I, I, there's, I will be in the field a ton. Uh, I will be on the agronomist tonight because it's Dale Cowan and I, I'm just forgetting who else, but they're talking about nitrogen decisions in the corn crop. And when it's this dry with probably very little mineralization, man, we, we going to have to make some really interesting discussions and decisions around that as well. You and I haven't even touched on that. So lots going on. Going to be a busy week. Yeah, and this uh, tonight's one of the special knowledge sharing events too, uh, as well. So uh, Dale Cowan from Agris Co-op and Jason De Bruin from Corteva will be on the show. Eight o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Mountain. You can tune in by going to the Real Agriculture YouTube channel or follow it at realagriculture.com slash live. That's eight o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Mountain, uh, seven Central. <laughs> for everybody to, got to get all the time zones in there while we're talking about it. So uh, really, really good information tonight. Uh, fun, interactive chat. Uh, the chat is always, uh, take, it takes on a life of its own. That, that is for sure. Hey, Pete, thanks so much for joining us here today on uh, Real Ag Radio. Hey, thanks for having me, Sean. You have a great week as well. And uh, bring some rain to Ontario if you could, please. And we could use a little bit more here too in Southern Alberta. We're both asking for the same thing. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio right after this. ABJ AgriProducts is North America's exclusive distributor for air bubble jets and easy jets. These sprayer nozzles reduce the number of driftable droplets and at the same time maintain a uniform droplet size, primarily between 300 and 400 micron, ensuring more even dispersion of your chemical products, providing reduced drift and increased plant coverage. Let us help improve your spraying operation by visiting abjagra.com. That's A-B-J-A-G-R-I dot com. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Back 
to Real Lag Radio here on Agronomic Monday. Let's talk canola now. And this is an interview we're going to play here is with Sean Sanko of the Canola Council of Canada. He talked to Real Agriculture's Kara Ustros. This is a recent Canola School episode that you can find by going to canolaschool.com. We've got a great on-demand library on our YouTube page as well as at canolaschool.com. Really providing you with information on demand. You can consume it when you need it. And a very, very timely, relevant agronomic information is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Today, we're going to hear Kara and Sean talking about the early detection of blackleg in your canola. Here's their discussion. Hey, Kara Ustros here with RealAgriculture.com. I am back here today with another Canola School episode. And I have here with me Sean Sanko of the Canola Council of Canada. How's it going today, Sean? Good, thanks. We're in southern Saskatchewan and it's raining. So really, how, how can we go wrong? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> So we're talking about, you know, looking for blackleg in the early season and what some of the things, you you know, we all, when we think of blackleg, we often think of, you know, clipping those stems later on after harvest, what we can be looking for. But do you want to talk about what you kind of can be doing now at this time of year? Well, this time of year, like in the actual canola crop that's coming up, um, there's not a lot you're going to see. It'd be really tough to, to see any um black leg lesions they'd be really small um so really what you you're looking for if you're looking for anything is the previous year's canola stubble from the last time you grew canola to see any of the pathogen is is growing on that stubble and uh and really it's more about risk with um you know this time of year knowing what um uh, what your risk factors are and are you in a high risk situation from previous years so talk about some of these risk factors well, number one would be just, uh, do you know what um, black leg pressure is? Like, have you clipped stems um, in the previous crop? And if you haven't, I'd consider that a higher risk situation because you, you don't know what's going on. And of course, factors like um, tight rotation, you know, that uh, canola every second year, um, growing the same variety multiple times, you know then you've been using the same um, background resistance um, on the field. So things like that are, are some of the, the um, keys that can really lead to um, black leg issues. Okay, so if you are in one of these high risk situations, I mean, I know if we see black leg later in the season, there's not really anything we can do about it. Is there anything you can do about it if you know you're in a high risk situation? Yeah, if you're in, in a high risk situation, um, there are black leg fungicides out there, but the the key with them really is it's got to be early. Like I I think um, the leaves would be two leaves. So ideally, cod lean one leaf. Um, would be the ideal timing for it. So really, if you're you're going to do it, you want to be in just um, in that early time. If you if you miss the timing, um, there's not a lot of effectiveness of the, uh, the fungicide. So talk a bit about the cycle of black leg and, w- and why we would want to spray it early. That's that's when it really develops, is in those early stages. And that's when the plant is infected in those early stages. So again, you you don't really see it. Um, that's when the, the 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 wound enters the plant, um, and then you know it'll progress through the season. And when you're cutting those stems at the end of the season and you see that blackening, that's really the, you know, the, the last part of the life cycle. So um, it's, it's really nothing visual that you can see right from the time of um, seeding up till that, that stem cutting. And maybe a bit of a message there too, if you see black like this year on your field to keep those records, because in a couple of years when you go back to canola... Yes, exactly. It's you know cutting those stems in the in the fall is key because then you can do things like um, well if if you know you've got high black leg pressure, I mean the number one thing would be you know extending the the rotation out um, or you know looking into what um, what uh, resistance genes am I using in uh, in that year where I had the issue and and rotating out to uh, another um, uh, resistance gene or you can also get um, black leg race testing done so you actually know what the race in that field is then you can match up the proper variety to have the the proper resistance to that um that uh pathogen in the field can black leg infect worse so say if you get wind damage hail damage any of those kind of flea beetle damage can black leg move in or like to those lesions or is that not really an issue yeah any any wounds in the plant early on in the season um can be an entry point for for black leg so yeah anything that um, wounds that plant it just kind of it helps take some of the defense down and that's where the black leg um, pathogen can enter the the plant Black leg, definitely one of those diseases that does threaten the canola crop from a yield standpoint. And, and I think overall acre growth, 
for, for sure over the, the long term. There's club loot, there's black leg, uh, obviously flea beetles wrecking havoc in, uh, on a year to year basis. So uh, definitely one of those things that that really uh, we need to be aware of and, and scouting for. Scout, 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 scout. That really, really is one of the answers when it comes to a lot of this disease. And canola companies working very digitally and hard trying to always find genetic solutions to help us deal with this problem as rotations seem to uh, remain to be tight when it comes to the canola crop in in western canada when we come back on real ag radio we're going to hop into the top ag news stories of the day Join us for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, August 15th to 17th at Calgary, Alberta. Spend time networking on the trade show floor, hear from keynote speakers, take in breakout sessions designed to increase profit, manage your rangeland and navigate trends. Get up close to advanced techniques and hands-on demos and experience bullfighting at the closing party. Proud, innovative and loyal, we are beef. Registration is now open. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for the top ag news stories of the day. But first, I want to mention Real Ag Shops. Would you like to be featured on our new episode of Real Ag Shops? New series we're launching by a sponsor or with sponsor Princess Auto. So I encourage you to reach out to me, shaney at realagriculture.com is my email address. If you have a shop that you think is really cool and should be featured. Now, it doesn't need to be new. It could be a shop that you've just kind of fixed up and you're doing some really cool, effective stuff in there. You get added some new features, whatever it is. Uh, we are very interested in, in talking to you. So uh, reach out to me by that email and uh, let me know. Okay, let's get into the top bag news stories here. And off the top, commodity prices are in retreat, signaling a slowdown in the world economy, but lending central banks a hand in their fight against inflation. This is according to a story in the, in, sorry, in the Wall Street Journal. The S&P GSCI Commodities Index has fallen about 11% so far this year through Friday as prices for energy, metals, grains, and other raw materials have retreated. Crude oil is close to its lowest level since just before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Even after Saudi Arabia's weekend decision to cut output boosted prices early Monday, wheat hasn't been this cheap since 2020, and natural gas has taken a tumble in Europe. Almost every commodity besides weather-affected sugar, cocoa, and coffee has pulled back. Niche materials, such as glass, have fallen. Copper, a bellwether for the global economy because of its use in everything from building to cars, has slipped 1.3% this year. So this is something, you think back to last week's discussion with Errol Anderson from Pro Market Wire, this is exactly what he's talking about. He is saying that the signals are there, that inflation is not as big of an issue as, as some people are making out, and we're actually in, going to be in a relatively quickly in a deflationary environment. Now, uh, everybody has different perspectives. There is another argument to that, but from this standpoint, in this article, that's exactly what Errol is is talking about expectations that interest rates would fall before December help boost markets this year, but persistent strength in the economy has surprised a lot of investors. Derivative markets show investors now expect the Federal Reserve's target rate to sit at five percent at, at year end, according to TradeWeb, up from just about four percent last month. The disappearance of bets on rate cuts has driven up short-term Treasury yields, but the climb hasn't rattled other markets. That pattern, in which stocks have benefited from expectations of the Fed rate cuts and from signs the economy will remain strong has made it especially challenging to forecast the market's path going forward, investors say, according to a story in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and we've been talking about this. It, it seems that some of the, the people that, you know, the, the, the overall market can... Or, 
there was a lot more people believing about a month ago that we would see some some uh, interest rate cuts in the back half of 23. A lot of that from some of the recent economic data that's come out has really sort of evaporated quick. Over the weekend, I already alluded to this, but Saudi Arabia plans to cut 1 million barrels of oil a day in July on top of previously announced curbs, while OPEC and its Russia-led allies agreed to stick to current production targets until the end of the year. Saudi Arabia was pushing some members to cut output But tensions within the group over production quotas were high. The Saudi decision to cut output, which it said can be extended, could help boost oil prices in the short term, but analysts expect them to continue to trend lower. U.S.-China tension over Taiwan escalated over the weekend as the Chinese and American warships got too close for comfort in the Taiwan Strait. If you haven't seen the video of this, it's like, man... (laughs) We're just, we're flirting with disaster. The U.S. military released a video of the incident. American officials said the Chinese vessel performed an unsafe maneuver, effectively cutting off the U.S. ship and forcing it to slow down. Yeah, that, that, th- there couldn't be a bad outcome from any of that. Only one, uh, in other news, only one case of avian influenza reported in Canada in May. Kelvin uh, posted this study or uh, story on realagriculture.com. There are plenty of unknowns surrounding the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak that has killed millions of chickens and turkeys on farms across North America going back to early 2022. But a drop in the number of new cases in the month of May is a positive sign for the poultry sector. Now, some of this has happened because of improved biosecurity, reduced uh, shedding by wild birds, different weather patterns, random luck, or a combination of all the above. The why part is unclear and should no doubt be subject of some research. The reduced case numbers may not necessarily mean the risk has dropped, but having fewer farms infected is certainly a step in the right direction. Interesting story from The Logic. And talking about, they they did a they do a subscriber. They're a subscription only news service, and every month they they survey subscribers, <clears throat> and they said that more than thirty percent of respondents to the Logic's May subscriber survey said they are very concerned that the anti ESG movement could impact environmental, social, and governance policies in Canada. Another 27% said they were a little concerned, 4% said they were not very concerned, and 12% said not concerned at all. Every business relies on environment, social, and governance stability to function, said one subscriber. There must be a responsible sector that recognizes, honors, and protects our privilege to function with our, within our environmental and human context. As the logic previously reported, anti-ESG sentiments have been growing in the U.S., And some groups have asked Canada's big banks to commit to ongoing fossil fuel financing and shelve or suspend net zero emission targets. You know, I, I, you could describe it as anti ESG. I I just wonder if instead some of this is being misinterpreted as just people asking sober second thought questions on what we're doing. It does make me wonder when we get to the next Canadian federal election, and I know there's a lot of numbers showing. That you know, overall Canadians, one of their you know one of their big concerns is how Canada deals with climate change, and I, I just wonder if if we do hit a real rough patch in the Canadian economy in the back half of twenty three, early part of two thousand twenty four, how all of a sudden, and if there is an election in spring of twenty four, how much pressure there is on the federal government. The, you know the, the current liberal government to back at, back off on some of the increases to the carbon tax is or are those are, are those raises something that no matter what happens economically Canadians believe that much in climate change I, I do wonder and I, I think that the, the conservatives task is still to work to separate you can fight climate change without a carbon tax. And separating those two is something that they're going to have to really, really employ if they want to win the next election. Interesting stuff. Okay, if you have any feedback, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Remember our task at the beginning, what are the three U.S. and Canadian ag weaknesses and strengths? You can send those to those emails. Thanks so much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio, and we'll chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.